Welcome to the webinar, Venezuela Chooses, What is at Stake in the Coming Elections, which is jointly organized by Orinoco Tribune and the International Manifesto Group, featuring four eminent analysts who will discuss various aspects of the upcoming presidential election in Venezuela. Today is part one of this webinar series. The next part will be next Sunday, that is July 14, at the same time, so remember that date also. So Venezuela goes to the polls on 28th July, 2024, that is the last Sunday of this month, to elect the president for the next six-year term that will begin on 10th January next year. So this election is taking place amidst a hybrid war against Venezuela, a war not of Venezuela's choosing, but imposed by the United States. The main feature of this war is a ferocious and all-encompassing economic, financial, and trade blockade carried out through 936 unilateral coercive measures imposed by the United States, the UK, Canada, the European Union that have gravely affected the country's economy and all walks of life. This war also includes repeated coup attempts, assassination attempts, terror plots, and even a fake government that nobody elected, but that stole most of Venezuela's assets abroad with US blessings and collusion. This war also gets conducted in the media sphere, as is evident from the anti-Venezuela smear campaign by all mainstream media. And unfortunately, even some alternative media fall into the trap of what I like to call the Venezuela exception, which is the notion that everything that Venezuela does is bad. <laughs> Despite all this, President Nicolas Maduro has continued the radical transformation of Venezuela that began under Hugo Chavez. Under Maduro's leadership, Venezuela has weathered the storm, shortages and hyperinflation have been overcome. And in a remarkable transition that has not been televised, Venezuela has become self-sufficient in food production and various other productive sectors in ways unknown for, I would like to say, since colonization. Moreover, President Maduro's astute political strategy has brought all factions of the opposition into the electoral path including the US-backed hardline opposition sectors grouped into the unitary platform for democracy. In October 2023, the unitary platform and the Venezuelan government signed the Barbados Agreement, which guaranteed that each political faction or party or coalition could select its presidential candidate freely, as long as the candidate was eligible to participate according to the Venezuelan constitution and Venezuelan electoral laws. There was another agreement between the governments of Venezuela and the United States signed in Doha, where the US pledged support for the Barbados Agreement. Thereafter, the United States Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control issued limited licenses for the Venezuelan oil, gas, and gold sectors, which were under, already under sanctions, in return for the release of opposition figures and US citizens who had been in prison in Venezuela for their involvement in coup attempts and terrorist plots. However, after a series of violations of the Barbados Agreement committed by both the unitary platform and its US backers, the agreement had been discarded and replaced by a new accord reached in May in the National Consensus Dialogue in Venezuela that led to the electoral schedule. Thereafter, the United States government returned to its original regime change policy, canceling its licenses, and is now threatening to deny the legitimacy of the July 28th election results because allegedly the elections are not free and fair which I suppose uh, because the United States authorities favored candidate, the extremist politician Maria Corina Machado has not been allowed to run. Machado was disqualified from holding political office for 15 years for uh, acts of treason she had committed in 2014. And this ban was ratified in January this year by the Supreme Court of Venezuela. Although you would not say this in Western mainstream media that projects Machado as a victim of the dictatorial Maduro regime. Machado, despite being qualified, disqualified, had continued to insist on her candidacy until the last moment when the unitary platform was forced to name a substitute candidate, the retired career diplomat Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia. However, even among the unitary platform sympathizers, there are voices that question Gonzalez's autonomy and decision-making power independent from Machado, as it appears that he is only acting as her agent which borderlines illegality, according to electoral laws anywhere in the world, I would suppose. So as the election date approaches, 
All opinion polls in Venezuela are showing that the incumbent candidate, President Nicolas Maduro, is the clear favorite, with voting intentions for him crossing 50% in all polls. Meanwhile, the hard right opposition is launching a campaign on uh, mainstream media and social media, crying fraud even before the election has taken place. This reflects this opposition sector's usual strategy, a strategy which has been applied time and again in Venezuela with disastrous consequences. And let's remember the latest ones, the violence of 2014, 2017, and the self-proclamation of Guaido in 2019, accompanied by a violent coup attempt that continues to this day. Thus, it is evident that the stage is being set for the United States to declare the Venezuelan elections fraudulent and illegitimate and to continue its regime change efforts against a country that is at the forefront of the multipolar and democratic transitions in Latin America. So this webinar involving a range of experts will analyze the challenges of this decisive moment in Venezuela's history. Uh, we have four speakers today. Each speaker will speak for 15 minutes maximum. And after all of them have finished their presentations, there will be a question and answer session. I request the listeners to put their questions in the chat. Your questions will be summarized and presented to the panelists for their response during the Q&A session. Now uh, let's uh, open up the webinar for our speakers. The first speaker is Maria Paez de Victor. She is a sociologist born in Venezuela and educated in Caracas, New York, Mexico City, England, and Canada. For several years, she taught sociology of health and medicine, as well as health and environmental policies at the University of Toronto. She is an expert in policy analysis and impact assessment, specializing in the areas of health, environment, and energy. So, uh, Maria, uh, now the microphone is yours. You can start your presentation. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you for that uh, very thorough uh, introduction. Um, before I start, I, I want to thank you for organizing this, uh, Jesus and Radica. But although my topic isn't geo geo uh, politics. I have to say one thing first, that Venezuela is at the vanguard of the defense of democracy, of socialism, and indeed of humanism today, now in this world, in this year of elections that are elections that are taking place all over the place, where you we see the rise of of the right in Europe, in Scandinavia, um, well, it's quite astounding. Uh, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, Hungary, Sweden, um, with the grand exception, uh, thank God, <laughs> of the labor uh, win in England. So uh, what is happening in Venezuela is not just a, a small thing and not just want, uh, something related to North America. Now I'm gonna try and share this screen. Can you see this? Can you sh can you see this? Yes, yes, I can see. Yes, okay. it's visible. Okay. So um, the uh, uh, the other first thing I want to say is that we're looking at a new colonialism. It's a resource colonialism. It isn't necessarily to take over a, a, a land, you know, a territory, but it's to crush the sovereignty uh, of nations, to debilitate governments to impose a tutelage over them. Uh, why? Because they're looking for the natural resources and the uh, he hegemonic and economic advantages. And it's tools, of course, military has always been, but now more and more corporations. And I want to stress that the only imperialist nation in the USA, and I say this for those of you who are always looking strangely at Russia and China, the only one imperialist nation is the United States because it's the only one who has about 800 military bases around the world, and 76 of those bases are in Venezuela. I'm uh, sorry, in Latin America. And its military budget is unbelievable. You can't even think uh, how much it is, about a trillion dollars, and it's more than the next 10 uh, uh, countries. Now, the other thing that is really important to understand is that the EU and Canada have become uncritical followers of US foreign policies. This hasn't always been the case. 
even during the Cold War, but now they are uncritically little poodles following the U.S. foreign policies. And what you the U.S. wants is utterly not just to, to, to buy Venezuela's uh, oil and gas, but to utterly control the vast oil reserves uh, of, uh, of Venezuela. And what Canada wants, Canada, who is the, uh, the mining capital of the world, is to control its uh, enormous gold, uh, uh, gold reserves. Now, a little bit of background uh, that I'm sure you all know but that the USA is a corporate state. It, it, its core is the military industrial complex that Eisenhower, um, you know, uh, warned about. Um, there were 7,000 corporations in 1970s. Today, there are about 65,000. And uh, uh, it's really interesting what Chris Hedges uh, says, how the corporate power in the United States has destroyed its own democracy, its own welfare state, its gutted wars, its, uh, its looted the U.S. Treasury, because these corporations rise at the expense of democracy, even their own. And what they are doing is conducting a, re a resource colonialism, imperialism towards Latin America, of course, with the economic weapon of the power of the dollar. And by the way, they have eroded international law. All this question about rule of law, that's nonsense because they have made nonsense of it. And you know that over a century, uh, the USA has looted and killed any reformist in Latin America. Now let's look at Canada's background. The most important factor in Canadian foreign policy is its economic relationship to the USA. This is this seems to be the only thing that is important for foreign policy here. In the from 45 to the mid 50s, um, George Grant famously said how Canada had become a, blank, a branch plant of U.S. economy. And the Canadian elites identify themselves not with their people, not with the Canadian people, but with the elites in the USA. And all that's essential. They send their children to Harvard. They go there for their vacations. They send their lawyers there, all of this. And since 9-11, the integration has been even greater because under the uh, the the uh, idea that they needed a defense, that North America needed a defense, Canada joined the empire. The military, the Canadian military was delighted with this, okay? And so they joined the global war on terror, the disciplinary militarism towards the third world and global exploitation. Canada's intervention has been rather uh, a failure. Uh, their, their, their failure in Afghanistan, in Haiti is horrendous. And of course, their Lima group in which they hoped to crush Venezuela was a complete debacle. Um, and Canada enthusiastically embraced all the uh, the uh, sanctions of the United States, broke relations with Venezuela, stopped embassies, consulates, and stopped Venezuelan Canadians to vote in the presidential elections in, 280, uh, in 2018. That's how uh, democratic they are. And by the way, Venezuela has never done anything to Canada, nor to any Canadian citizen. Canada and Venezuela are not at war with each other, and yet these things have happened. So the Canadian military is seamlessly integrated with the American, and so is the Canadian oil industry. Now, Justin Trudeau is right now very unpopular. He's fighting for his political life, but waiting in the wings is Pierre Polyèvre, a mediocre far-right conservative whose wife is a Venezuelan of the extreme opposition. I'm going to skip the hybrid war against Venezuela because um, uh, uh, this was covered in the introduction. Uh, the illegal sanctions, I am sure that Francisco Dominguez will, will talk about that, but I just want to, to, to say two things. It's 930 sanctions. Only Russia has had more sanctions than Venezuela. And these sanctions contracted our economy by more than 50%. And uh, the international markets for food and medicine and financial transactions were, were, were stopped for Venezuela. And this meant a deliberate, deliberately induced hunger and scarcity. 100,000 Venezuelans died. And to add uh, insult to injury, the monies of Venezuelans' assets in billions in foreign banks were handed to Guaido and his band of criminals. And the worst thing, another a crime against humanity during the COVID, USA, EU, and Canada 
did not allow Venezuela to buy Western vaccines. Thank God for Cuba, Russia, and China and their vaccines. Now, what are the Canadian interests? The Canadian interests is mining. The Canadian companies have sued Venezuela because it nationalized some uh, mines and also because it wants the private public investments divided in 40, 60, 60 being for uh, Venezuela. And uh, Canada is the mining headquarters of the world. They want Venezuelan gold reserves. This is the big pressure that these uh, mining corporations have over the uh, uh, Ottawa. And both, it didn't matter conservative or liberals, they've all shown great hostility towards Venezuela. And indeed in 2010, Stephen Harper, the previous uh, minister, uh, his, his trade minister said, admitted that the secondary goal of our candidates of all the countries that wanted to have a free trade agreement, it wanted it with Colombia because it wanted to bolster that country's right-wing government against Venezuela. We're talking about Uribe and Duque, not Petro. I'm gonna skip the presidential elections because I'm sure that William is gonna talk about it, but do not believe the lies of the New York Times, even today, writing about how Nicolás Maduro is very unpopular. He leads the polls. Wherever he goes, it's hundreds and thousands who are uh, following him. But very important, the two extreme uh, right candidates refuse to sign a declaration to say that they will um, that they will uh, respect the uh, election results and won't incur in violence. So they 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 they're just ready to shout fraud fraud and they're doing it already. So uh, violence has already started. They there have been about six attempts to kill a president, many sabotages to the electrical system, and even the bridge over over the Orinoco. And lately, uh, Orinoco uh, Tribune uh, uh, released the news that Colombian paramilitaries have been asked by right-wing groups to help them destabilize the government. I have to put this up here because I want the world to remember and know what Jimmy Carter said in 2012, that as a matter of fact of the 92 elections that we've monitored, I would say the election process in Venezuela is the best in the world. And I'm sure William will talk more about that. Now, the latest negotiation is really important. The USA has asked Maduro for negotiations. For two months, they've been asking him. Finally, he said yes, under these conditions that they're going to talk about the Accord de Qatar, respect for Venezuelan sovereignty. And this was a genius thing, an open negotiations with no secrecy. What this does is, first of all, it is the recognition of the United States as Maduro, the only president, and his government, the only government. And second of all, it was the isolation of the far right opposition who had no idea that this was coming. And they aren't in these negotiations, not even as observers. So Maduro is in a strong position. He has a window of opportunity between now and November 5th, because in this presidential year in the United States, a hike in the, in the gasoline pr uh, prices would be highly damaging to the Democratic Party. Fracking has reached its peak and oil reserves are very low in the United States because they have released these oil reserves in order to uh, lower the price of gas. Now, the other thing that is really interesting, because we don't really know what's happening, is that the U.S. corporations are not monolithic. There is rivalry between them, especially between Venezuela, uh, uh, with respect to Venezuela. Uh, for example, ExxonMobil and Chevron. Chevron has been very happy to work with Venezuela, but not ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is the avowed uh, enemy of Venezuela. Now, here is really another interesting thing this year. The oil refineries of Texas and Louisiana need Venezuela's heavy oil because they were created, built for this heavy oil. And they have lobbied extensively for the sanctions to be eliminated. You should hear what the Association of Oil Producers of Texas are saying. And in this year where there's going to be election, the electoral votes of Texas and Louisiana combined is 48 whereas Florida has only 30. And those 30 in, in Florida are never gonna vote for the Democrats ever. So I think that uh, the Democratic Party is looking very carefully at that. And what has changed in Venezuela, the economic growth and the international market. And again, I think that, uh, I think it's Francisco Dominguez who's gonna be talking about this, but this is amazing. 
Maduro's economic policies have diversified the economy. Venezuela is self-sufficient in food. It has open markets all over the world. It, it's an inflation, which used to be, can, can you imagine 300,000% in, in super inflation is now 7%. Its GDP is 8% at the end of 2024, the largest in the region. So what has increased that the, uh, is what has happened is that Maduro um, lured back the private uh, sector who now finally the penny dropped and realized that those sanctions, which they asked for, uh, has really uh, help, uh, hurt them. And so they are going to uh, now, they are now investing in, in in Venezuela. Why? Because they realize that Maduro has opened the world to them, opened enormous markets for them. And if Venezuela enters the BRIC next year, which is quite uh, surely is going to happen, that means it's going to be even more markets for Venezuela. So right now, nations are lining up to buy Venezuelan oil and gas, especially China, India, Turkey, and Russia. What has changed in Canada? Well, what has changed is Trudeau's fighting for his political life. The for, his foreign policy in Latin America has failed. Now he says he wants a new approach, but we haven't seen anything. He, it, this is just something that one of his ministers has said. He hasn't actually done anything. Um, and this is important. A Canadian oil company, the new Stratus Energy, has made a big deal with PDVSA. He did, he did it through a company in the, uh, in the Virgin Islands, I think, to invest uh, an enormous amount of, I, I think, 25 million um, investment in oil production. So here's a Canadian company telling the Ottawa, or uh, telling Ottawa, I don't care what you say, I'm going to invest in Venezuela. And uh, Maduro's eminent election, which is just going to be, uh, you know, no matter what these media said, he's going to be reelected, coupled with the U.S.'s willingness to negotiate with Maduro, these two things are going to influence Canada's approach too. I leave the recent, recent interlaced po uh, poll there for you. Now, Maduro has said many times that he wishes a normal relationship with the United States. He wants these sanctions to disappear, but he will not tolerate the opposition violence. He will not tolerate fascism. And this is something he said just last week. Fascist, we will not permit this in Venezuela. Peace is going to be triumphant before, during, and after the 28th of July. And the Bolivarian revolution is, is a Revolución Bonita, as we say, a, a pretty revolution, but it is not an unarmed revolution. Apart from its formidable armed forces, it has five million militia civilian members throughout the country keeping the peace, and they have done it. They have done some wonderful things, that militia. Now, violence threat now is internally from these uh, far-right uh, extremists, Maria Corina Machado, Leopoldo Lopez, uh, Capriles, all these people, and the external threat of violence for Venezuela is ExxonMobil, who has taken over Guyana with the help of the Southern Command. I uh, will we can talk about that at another time, but I just want to close with something that Harry Wilkinson said. He's a retired U.S. Colonel, former Chief of Staff of Colin Powell, and I just want to quote it entirely. I know the Venezuelan military. I've trained some of them, most of them, if the U.S. military arrives in Venezuela, will enter the very formidable hills with jungle backdrops. They will harass, kill, take prisoners from time to time, and in general, they will endure forever or until the gringos leave. We could remember how the North Vietnamese and the Taliban did it. So will the Venezuelans. My dear friends, we will... Uh, overcome, as the Cubans say, venceremos. I am not uh, at all um, worried about the elections. Uh, wherever Nicolás Maduro uh, shows his, his face, uh, people just come out in, in hordes to see him. Uh, and this is not covered by the press, but it is covered by the press in Venezuela. So I think we have a lot to be thankful for and to be um, very hopeful for. And thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope I I did it in 15 minutes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, 
Thanks a lot, Maria, for that wonderful and like extensive, very detailed presentation. You always come up with the data and everything. So it's, it's I mean, it is expected that you will do this at every time. And it was very wonderful to you know, mentioning all the sanctions and every everything that has been happening in Venezuela, including ExxonMobil and the you know, mm, problem with Guyana. So uh, we, we might have some questions later about this. Uh, now I will uh, welcome the next speaker, Joe Emersberger. He is an engineer, a writer, and activist based in Canada with Ecuadorian roots. His writing, focused on the Western media's coverage of the Americas, can be found on FAIR.org, Counterpunch, The Canary, Telesor English, Zcom, and of course, Orinoco Tribune, which has published many of his writings. Joe is co-author with Justin Podur of the book Extraordinary Threat, the U.S. Empire, the Media, and 20 Years of Coup Attempts Against Venezuela. So, Joe, the mic is yours. You are welcome to start your presentation. Okay. Thanks very much to all the organizers of the seminar. I'm very honored to have been invited to speak. Uh, now, we, we have two seminars this week and next week, and we have several speakers. So, for that reason, I've decided to focus on, uh, in some detail, about a topic I might not, other, not otherwise have addressed. That's the track record of the Carter Center in Venezuela. Uh, much of this material is covered in the book I wrote with Justin Boudoir, but I'll, I'll also put online the, the, this talk, or at least the outline of it. It includes citations there if people are interested later to look at it. Uh, the Carter Center will be observing the upcoming presidential election in Venezuela. So I'm going to explain why Venezuela's government allowing the Carter Center to do this on July 28th is actually a huge concession. And I'll, I'll argue that Venezuela would be more than justified in telling the Carter Center to stay away. Now, uh, why am I doing that? I mean, the Carter Center is not an organization whose track record stands out as bad compared to other U.S.-based NGOs, think tanks, and corporate media outlets. Uh, in 2004, uh, when Hugo Chavez won a recall referendum by a 20-point margin, the Carter Center refuted uh, statistical arguments that were put forward by the likes of uh, Venezuelan uh, economist Ricardo Hausman, claiming that the election had been stolen. Um, the Carter Center actually went to the trouble of hiring uh, statisticians to refute Hausman's arguments. Okay, but please bear in mind, I mean, that was a good thing, but please bear in mind, this was a 20-point victory that Chavez had achieved in 2004. Uh, the level of fraud required to pull that off would have left a mountain of evidence. So we should not get carried away praising the Carter Center for refuting Houseman's arguments. Uh, I mean, if you, if you can't defend a 20 point victory with a ballot counting system as good as Venezuela is, and really what would good argue? I mean, defending that victory was the bare minimum you would do if you had any integrity or competence at all. But uh, defending a 20 point victory in, 20, in 2004 is not all there is to, uh, to the Carter Center's track record. Now consider that in 2002, well, only four days after a military coup briefly ousted Hugo Chavez. And there was an op-ed uh, op by Jennifer McCoy that appeared in the New York Times. Jennifer McCoy was the Carter Center's director for the Americas. Uh, she referred to the Chavez government in that op-ed as a regime that had been, in her words, threatening the country's democratic system of checks and balances and freedom of expression of its citizens. She also said that Pedro Carmona, the dictator who presided over the deaths of about 60 protesters in those two days he was in power, seemed to, in her words, seemed to demonstrate the autocratic instincts as strong as those driving Mr. Chavez. So she actually had the gall to compare Chavez to, to Carmona. And her piece also downplayed the U.S. role in the 2002 coup by saying that Washington had sent, in her words, mixed signals about it. Well, there was absolutely nothing mixed about Washington's support for the coup. Aside from U.S. officials uh, parroting Carmona's justification for the coup, the IMF, whose Latin American policy is run by Washington, immediately stepped forward to publicly offer Carmona's dictatorship loans. In fact, the IMF official who did that was a former U.S. State Department official, Thomas Dawson. Now, I, I, in the U.S., and I'd say in the West in general, we come under a lot of pressure to let things like this pass, to support politicians or groups who offer very limited dissent against Western imperialism and ignore that they reinforce very toxic imperial assumptions the way Jennifer McCoy did at that op-ed. Now, consider a widely cited remark by uh, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, who, of course, founded the Carter Center. He said in 2012 that Venezuela's ballot counting system was the best in the world. Okay, that's, that's, 
um, I think, true. <laughs> and uh, as somebody who's personally observed Venezuela's elections, it's, it's extremely impressive. But in 20, bear in mind, again, let's not get carried away and praising him for saying that. Bear, where, where, when did he say it? In 2012. Venezuela's economy under Chavez was in the best shape it had ever been in its entire history, if you consider a wide range of development uh, indicators. And even if you just look very narrowly at real GDP per capita by itself, that was close to its historic peak in 2012. So it's not surprising under these conditions that existed in 2012 that the liberal end of the U.S. establishment represented by people like Carter would not be in full attack mode against Chavismo. But Jump ahead to 2019, February of 2019, things were drastically different. Uh, the U.S. under Trump pulled an aid stunt at the Colombian border that had many of us very concerned that the U.S. might possibly invade Venezuela at that time. I, by that time, in February of 2019, Venezuela's economy had been devastated by a deep and sustained drop in oil prices, combined with the impact of crippling U.S. Uh, sanctions for several years. I mean, what was Carter saying then in, in February of 2019? I mean, the Carter Center put out a statement at that time, February 2019, attacking Maduro's government. The statement accused Maduro of having misused Carter's praise for uh, Venezuela's ballot counting system in 2012. Carter's statement did not utter, utter a word criticizing U.S. efforts to overthrow Maduro, even as it looked like Trump might possibly invade. Not a word criticizing U.S. sanctions that became undeniably murderous since 2017. And in that statement, the Carter Center very bizarrely accused Maduro's government of illegitimate interference in Venezuela's election. They actually used the word interference. That part was so absurd, I had to read it over a few times to make sure I had misread something. But to liberals like Carter, foreign governments are obliged to sit back and let themselves be overthrown by U.S.-backed subversives. Now, Carter's statement also stated uh, in 2019, disingenuously, that the Carter Center had not formally observed an election in Venezuela since 2004. Now, as people often say nowadays, that word formally did a lot of work in that sense. The Carter Center had, in fact, put out a very detailed report on the April 2013 presidential election. Now, in preparing this talk, I looked over the Carter Center final report on the 2021 regional elections in Venezuela that, that I had observed myself. And I, I was quite disgusted by the report. The report contains exactly one mention of U.S. sanctions. Now, U.S. sanctions, aside from being criminal and murderous, are also massive election interference. I mean, the transparently barbaric objective is to convince voters that supporting U.S.-backed candidates is the only way to stop the sanctions. The only mention of U.S. sanctions in the Carter Center's report stated falsely that they were first imposed in 2018. In fact, Broad U.S. sanctions were first imposed by Obama in 2015 through an executive order that insanely declared Venezuela an extraordinary threat to the United States. That same executive order has been renewed every year since then. Trump dramatically escalated U.S. sanctions in 2017, and by 2018, studies showed that they could be credibly linked to tens of thousands of deaths in Venezuela. The Carter Center limited itself to a feeble remark that the sanctions were a factor that intensified a recession. Uh, that had been going on since 2014. Now, the report, it, it, this is really, really, really disgusting. The report also said that uh, the Alex Saab case was an example of a network organized to poison the information well, to stoke debate on only one topic. So to the Carter Center, pointing to U.S. criminality and brutality is an unfair tactic to use against U.S.-backed opposition. The, the Carter Center also described the U.S. capture of Alex Saab, which should be called a kidnapping, as if it were an unremarkable international law enforcement uh, exercise that the, the Maduro government had dishonestly portrayed as sinister. The Carter Center re uh, referred to it exactly in its word as the inf international warrant for the arrest of Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab and his subsequent extradition to the United States. There was no extradition treaty between the United States and Cape Verde when uh, Alex Saab was kidnapped. For, and for kid, he was kidnapped for the for for the for the uh, for because he was helping Venezuela evade criminal U.S. sanctions. I mean, today, you, a lot of you might be aware of this U.S. Supreme Court has basically ruled that U.S. presidents could do whatever they like. But this willingness to normalize U.S. executive lawlessness clearly extends to liberal outfits like the Carter Center. Now, let's consider Jimmy Carter himself. Uh, he, obviously, he's the founder of the Carter Center. He was an ex he has an extremely good reputation uh, for what he's done as an a after his presidency. But I, I, I say it's totally undeserved. 
He, he took office after the United States had just suffered a drawn out and humiliating defeat in Vietnam. So Carter was in no position to take the U.S. public into another war, not directly. The fact that Carter only had one term in office also helped minimize the damage to his reputation. But Carter did absolutely rotten things while he was in office. Carter funded the savage military of El Salvador, even after the late Archbishop Oscar Romero sent Carter a letter, a letter begging him not to do so. And even before the Sandinistas ousted the blood-soaked of Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua, Carter's government maneuvered to, to, to keep Somozaists in power, albeit without Somoza himself. And like every U.S. president since 1970, Carter lavishly armed the, the genocidal state of Israel, and Carter also armed the Indonesia as that carried out some of the largest scale atrocities of the post-World War II era. Now, Carter's stance on the Vietnam War is, off, is, just, is just monstrous. Uh, he, he, when he was governor of Georgia, uh, he was so outraged at the conviction of, of William Calley, the main perpetrator of the My Lai Massacre, uh, he was so worried that it might decrease support for the U.S. military that Carter used the day of Calley's conviction to declare an American Fighting Man, Man's Day in Georgia to make sure everyone knew how fully supportive he was of the slaughter of Vietnam, which is one of the worst, the slaughter, U.S. slaughter of Vietnam is one of the worst crimes of the entire 20th century. And as we all know, the 20th century was an incredible, incredibly gruesome century. I mean, then in, in his president, in 1977, Carter was once asked about the possibility of paying reparations to Vietnam. And his response was, was just gruesome. He, and he said, and I quote, the destruction was, music, was mutual. You know, we went to Vietnam without any desire to capture territory or, or to impose the American will on another people. We went there to defend the freedom of South Viet Vietnamese and don't feel that we ought to apologize or to castigate ourselves or to assume the status of culpability. Okay, so please, let's never go easy on the Carter Center or on Jimmy Carter or expect very much from them. Let's keep our eyes open about the kind of institution they are and what they're likely to say about the election that, that's coming up on July 28th. Uh, we who live in the Imperial Corps should try to spread the word about how amazingly tolerant of US backed sedition the Venezuelan government has been over the last 22 years. I'd say that inviting the Carter Center is just another example of that tolerance that it has for, for people that uh, really don't deserve to be in Venezuela at all to monitor anybody's election. Uh, if, if Maduro uh, loses on, on July 20, which I consider unlikely but possible, it would be a huge loss, not just for Venezuela, but for the entire world, as was the case when the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were defeated in the polls in 1990. The lesson Washington will take away is that terrorism eventually pays, that aggression eventually pays. For a time, it may seem that U.S. sanctions are ineffective or, or counterproductive, but the U.S. Uh, political system enjoys such a tremendous impunity that they can maintain their murderous sanctions indefinitely and hope that eventually conditions will arise that allow them to work. So again, watch the Carter Center very carefully. Uh, do not give them any credit for having uh, integrity and uh, watch them very carefully. Don't go easy on them. That's, that's the message of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe, for, let's say, for <laughs> busting the balloon surrounding the Carter Center's objectivity and everything, because it's like considered a sort of sort of objective uh, electoral observer, at least when it comes to Venezuela, although we know what Jimmy Carter did as president and even afterwards. So thanks a lot for your um, for your presentation, especially on this subject. Uh, I have, I, it is recently, like I recently saw somewhere that the United States government is apparently happy that the Carter Center is observing the Venezuelan elections. I don't know why they are happy. I don't really know why they're happy, but they are. So it's, it's very, it's interesting. We will, of course, keep an eye on the Carter Center and everyone else who is observing the European Union, for example, is not coming after all. So it had the same sort of problem. It had some sort of problem with the, um, well, they basically refused to follow the Venezuelan laws, which they should, but they didn't. So let's see who follows what and what they come up with, what sort of report they present, etc. So that's that's that was really an eye-opening, let's say, eye-opening presentation from you. Um, so before I uh, before I invite the next presenter, I would like to ask the listeners once again to put their questions in the chat. They will be summarized and presented to the speakers at the Q&A session just after the speakers finish their presentations. So our next uh, uh, presenter is Francisco Dominguez, who is a specialist on Latin America's contemporary political economy, about which he has published extensively. Uh, he is a former refugee from Pinochet, Chile. 
and is a national currently he is the national secretary of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign in the United Kingdom. He is also involved in solidarity activities with Cuba, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, and Mexico. He makes regular contributions to various alternative media on the subjects on which he is an like, expert. He is the co-author of right-wing politics in the new Latin America, and he is also the author of the pamphlet Maduro, a decade continuing Chavez's socialist anti-imperialist struggle. So it, we are very glad to have you here, Francisco, and you may begin the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me, and I put the link of the to my pamphlet on the chat for everyone. Uh, the reason is that it's a enormous amount of information there, which you know we don't have the time to discuss, to cover now. First of all, I want to say that um, Orinoco Tribune has become partly because of us in the UK a very important point of reference regarding what goes on in Venezuela and elsewhere. The quality of the information, the quality of the article, the quality of the coverage that Orinoco Tribune does every single time is really, really good. So congratulations to everyone. Uh, we used to use different sources. Now we concentrate, you know, preferably on Orinoco Tribune than everybody else. So thank you for that. Now, what I want to do is I want to answer the question, what the stakes are for this coming election? I'm going to cover some of the ground that's been covered already regarding the uh, sanctions and the consequences of this. And I want to discuss the question of the, what the stakes are, what is involved uh, at the end, if I may. Uh, number one, um, apart from the, the, the nine, 930, unilateral coercive measures, which are known as sanctions for the period 2016 to the period of from 2016 to 2023, uh, um, break down as follows. The United States imposed 441, Canada 108, Panama 70, Switzerland 56, the European Union only 55, and the United Kingdom 36. Now, the important thing about these sanctions is what exactly is being targeted. The sanctions blockaded food, medicine, vaccine, fuel, diluents, finances, and just about everything else. Um, the blockade on Venezuela, because it is a blockade, is a very comprehensive blockade. Um, it blockades foreign trade, the oil industry, the gold trade, and it goes further, 40 Conviasa planes are banned from traveling to several destinations. And 17 more Venezuelan aircraft are also banned. There are 60 ships in the ships, you know, boats. Um, my pronunciation is that time you trace me there. Uh, in, the, um, in the list of entities being sanctioned. There have been on top of that, the illegal conflict of freezing of Venezuelan assets in the United States, current accounts. Monomero is a company that belonged to Venezuela in uh, Colombia, was also taken over. Cidgo has been taken over. Monetary resources deposited in European financial institutions, 31 tons of gold in the Bank of England, all together amount to something like, you know, so far the information is not precise, but it's quite huge is between 40 to 60 billion dollars, which is a huge amount. And you can imagine all of this actually has affected Venezuela uh, terribly in many ways. I want to just highlight a few. Sigo was paying for high cost surgical operations, marrow bone, marrow bone plans, transplant particularly, abroad in Italy and other places. When Sigo was taken over by the United States with the collusion of white owned company, these operations were suspended. And many of these, some of them young uh, kids actually died as a consequence of waiting uh, to be operated that couldn't, they couldn't. And um, one of the consequences of financial blockade against Venezuela is the following. Venezuela pays money for services or goods that wants to obtain in the world market. Not only the bank or financial institution doesn't process the payment, but it retains the money which is really bad. 
not only it doesn't possess and should retain the money, it, con it retains it. So the result is, you know, all state body in state bodies in Venezuela have been targeted. It's very difficult for them, and no economy can survive without being able to actually operate, being inserted in the world economy. And um, state bodies are very kind: the oil industry, transport, public finances, finances, health, food, any other section, any other state that have been targeted. Taking all together, all the state publishers receive 80% of the sanctions. That is to say, it's been a very de determined, targeted, deliberate intention on part of the United States, those who organize this, to really hit the state as hard as they can. Just to give an example, in, in December 2017, 11 bonds of Venezuela and PDVSA debt for $1.2 billion couldn't be paid because they were obstructed by sanctions. In November 2017, 23 Venezuelan financial operations aimed at purchasing food, basic imports and medicines were not processed by international banks because they were blocked due to the sanctions. Many of the banks are terrified of challenging the United States blockade against you know, a third country. And this is a very, very significant part of the problem. So very quickly on the consequences. From uh, 56 billion, that Venezuela was receiving in revenues from its export activity, this declined to 743 million in 2020. That is to say, and this is repeated by leaders of the Bolivarian Revolution, Venezuela lost 99 out of every $100 that came in before uh, 2013. Uh, from 2015 to 2022, as a result of these sanctions, Venezuela lost 44 billions on average every year. That makes out a grand total of $308 billion, which is the equivalent of almost 20 Nicaraguan economies. That gives you an idea of the size of it. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, because of the sanctions, oil output from the oil industry in Venezuela fell by 80 to 90%. That is to say, Venezuela, from an average of 2.4 million barrels a day, began to produce less than 300,000. Um, these that meant that Venezuela lost $232 billion. So if you put this together, the, um, the consequences, the economic um, cost has been monumental. Um, inflation inevitably became hyperinflation, given the consequences of all these sanctions. And I remember vividly when Mrs. Lagarde um, predicted, on, as an official statement of the IMF, that the inflation in Venezuela is going to reach 1.5 million percent, which is something I just couldn't fathom in my head at the time, I remember. All of this was on top of black market hoarding, the scarcity of food and just about every other input. Um, some of the consequences have been, and this, there have been information on the part of the Venezuelan government, um, an increasing incidence of yellow fever, polio, influenza, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, hepatitis B, and hemophilus influenza type B. That is to say, the whole consequence of population, particularly the most vulnerable, has been horrible. Uh, the CEPR uh, produced a report in 2018 regarding the consequences of the sanctions, and they reckon there that the number of people that died as a consequence of the sanctions only between the year 2017 and 2018 was 40,000. Now, let's just stop there. I think the number of people who have died as a consequence of the sanctions is much more than 100,000. In Chile, the Pinochet dictatorship in 17 years assassinated 5,000 people. That gives you an idea this was equivalent of throwing bombs against the most vulnerable women, children, the uh, chronically ill and so on, because they were the ones, the victims of this horrible, nasty um, aggression from the United States and his accomplices against Venezuela. So, um, what is incredible, and I want to start to, run, to wrap up with this, what is incredible is the recovery. How can you, having been subjected to this extraordinary, monumental, 
asphyxiation of your economy, where literally you were hanging on from the fields of your fingernails, literally, you know, losing 99% of your revenues that came, were coming in to stay before. Only by having a government, only by having a state, only by having the institutions, only by having the organizations, the grassroots, the criminal councils, the women, the two unions, and so on, which exist in large quantities in Venezuela, only that kind of government, that kind of state, can actually protect the people of Venezuela from this aggression. And they were able to do that. Now Venezuela has recovered incredibly. The uh, expected rate of growth for the year 2024 it is expected to be between five to eight percent, which is one of the, will be one of the biggest in the, in Latin America. Um, exports have increased massively. Uh, Non-traditional exports, I'm referring to, you know, chocolate, uh, rum, which uh, we consume in London, and so many other wonderful things. Um, the amount of self-sufficiency on food that Venezuela has been able to achieve is extraordinary, and the fostering the promotion of the small businesses is very interesting. There are private, communally owned, uh, all sorts of arrangements, uh, but there are thousands, I think it's about 30,000 new small entrepreneurs who actually are covering, you know, supplying the population with what they need literally every single day. So the small scale industrial good production has increased substantially. And so, more important than that, despite all of these problems, which are gigantic, five million homes for the poor have been built. And Maduro com committed himself, committed government to build six more million in the next, sorry, six, mi six million more in the next few years. So the problem of housing is basically being resolved with a very convenient um, conditions for the working class. So to finalize uh, my point, where this government to disappear? Where this government to be defeated? I think the analogy with Nicaragua is sort of short of the possibilities in consequential terms. The level of hatred that exists in the ruling class, in the oligarchy in Venezuela is extraordinarily intense. The the Venezuelan opposition, the extreme right wing, Maria Corina Machado, Leopoldo Lopez, Julio Borges, and all these people who actually have fostered campaign to damage the countries as much as possible, including fomenting the possibility of an international military invasion and destruction of the country. If you read the details of the contract between Juan Guaido and the mercenary Guadro, uh, you know, in 2020 in May, uh, the contract allowed uh, these mercenaries to assassinate anybody without any legal consequences. That is to say, the idea was to eliminate complete terrorism. Um, the point I want to make regarding the opposition, this particular type of opposition, is they are not totally lackeys of the United States. It's worse than that. The United States owns them, it finances them, tells them what to do. They wouldn't do anything without the United States agreeing to them literally every single day. They're totally controlled by the United States. So the mistakes that they made come from the United States. You can imagine what it would mean to actually them coming back to office. They will dismantle absolutely everything. They will be engaging retribution and vindictiveness of every imaginable kind and will set Venezuela back more than 50 years of development, if not worse. And it would be very difficult to actually recover from that because the United States would militarize their support, let's call it that way, of any possible government. Back. So we need to redouble as much as possible our efforts in solidarity with Venezuela because what is stake for Venezuela is normal. Where Venezuela to go and where these to be the consequences, you can imagine the consequences for the rest of our continent. So it's extremely important. I think we are, we are a bit relaxed because Maduro is doing very well in the cold, but nevertheless, never be so sure because the opposition now, and they're already preparing the ground to declare that the election was rigged and it was fraught, and there's been information that some paramilitaries from Colombia have been contacted by the extreme right wing of Venezuela to bring in 1,000 paramilitaries to cause havoc 
on the day of the election to say to cause chaos so that you know they can demonstrate that the masses are against it. So it's very, very dangerous. And none of them will be done without somebody in the State Department somehow agreeing to it. So Viva Venezuela, let's redouble our support and thank you very much for the invitation. Mm. Thanks a lot, Francisco, for firstly for praising Orinoco Tribune's efforts to uh, to inform the world about the things that are happening in Venezuela as well as in Latin America, and we'll also say the world because we try to cover try to cover everything that mainstream media does not cover. So thanks a lot for the praise. I mean, it means a lot, and. I would also like to thank you for explaining what the term sanctions actually mean. I mean, sanction, the word sanction is, I think it is a euphemism because uh, these are unilateral coercive measures, illegal and they are murderous, which you mentioned. So thanks a lot for explaining what they are and what they have done to Venezuela, what they have stolen, helped steal, helped murder, etc. And I would also highlight how you highlighted the importance of state, importance of the state in the case of Venezuela. Because uh, Western left, people in the Western left generally tend to think the state as opposed to the people or as useless or something like that. Whereas in the case of Venezuela, if the state did not exist, then the Venezuelan people would really die. I mean, they have, I mean, the sanctions have killed. Venezuelan people, like you said, more than 100,000. It's, yeah, it's surely more than 100,000 by now, given COVID and everything. But despite that, I mean, if the state did not exist, then it, millions of Venezuelans could have died. So thanks a lot for all these points that you mentioned. I mean, they're all of them are very important and very enlightening. And thanks also for your pamphlet, which we were very proud to publish. Now we will come to our last speaker, William Kamakaro, who is a Venezuelan American activist. He is the National Joint Coordinator for the Alliance for Global Justice in the United States. Uh, and he is a co-founder of the Alberto Luera Bolivarian Circle of New York and a senior analyst for the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. He has published in several progressive uh, news outlets and he has also organized numerous delegations to Ecuador, Bolivia, and Venezuela. And so, the, William, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start your presentation. Hmm. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Okay. So, thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to thank to Jesus and also to everybody in Orinoco Tribune. Uh, that have been working in this panel and this uh, webinar, and also to the panelists. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for your excellent work. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about the Venezuelan opposition and a little bit about the election. So we have right now around 10 people registered as a candidate, but I want to mention some of them very briefly that are very... I will say interesting characters. We have, for example, Javier Bertucci, who is a, a evangelist a priest that has been running. This is the, I think, the third time, the second time that he has been running to be president of Venezuela. He's a rich man. He really had uh, some resources, some properties in Miami, in another part of the world. He's someone with a lot of resources, economy resources. We have someone like Claudio Fermi, who was a mayor of Caracas during, uh, I would say, I'm not sure, but was when, during Carlos Andres Perez. And we have also Enrique Marquez, who is uh, the right-wing candidate for the Communist Party of Venezuela. <laughs> and we have, uh, for, of course, Vene uh, President Maduro, and Manuel Rosales, who is the uh, governor of the state of Sudan, has been running several times to be president of Venezuela. Then we had this uh, very interesting character, Mundo González Urrutia. So those are, in my opinion, the, the most important candidates right now. Um, we need to know, and we need to really be conscious that the State Department is right in something. The election in Venezuela are not fair 
and are not transparent. The candidate of the revolution is um, basically, and his, all his closer uh, collaborators uh, are in danger constantly by the State Department. They have been, for example, President Maduro in the last six, nine months have been receiving uh, some uh, six different assassination attempts that have been neutralized by the by the Venezuelan government. Also, some of his some of the closer people to the president have been receiving assassination attempts. Um, recently, we heard that from President Maduro. Everybody mentioned this: the paramilitary group in Colombia uh, mm -hmm. denouncing that they received some. Uh, Singing up from the right wing in Venezuela, uh, asking the assistant to be to assassinate the Venezuelan president. And the United States also, at this moment, that is very critical, is asking the Venezuelan president to open a dialogue few days before the elections, which means that obviously they know that Maduro will win the election. You don't want to talk to someone that is going to lose, that will be not winning. You want to talk to someone that will be winning the election. We can see this as a distraction, but also we can see this as something strategic for them to talk to Maduro before the election to make some deal uh, in advance with the president. We, we have been able to see the, this uh, popular mobilization and support of President Maduro that have been, in my opinion, increased enormously after the imprisonment of Tarek William Alassami. When Alassami, the former president, the, the formerly all your, you know, Pide PDVSA president, uh, was arrested, and several members of the cabinet and several members of the National Assembly, uh, I think that people were released. A lot of people were talking about corruption in Venezuela, and suddenly we see, we were able to solve, to see, and May 1st, one of the biggest May 1st uh, demonstration after three years in Venezuela. And that happened just after a few weeks, uh, Teresa Aleisami was incarcerated with a bunch of people that were close to him. Um, and, and the population has been mobilizing more and more. And that's my opinion. Um, that is the people feel connected with the president after, or reconnect with the president after Tarek al went to prison. Although Maduro is winning this poll, we must consider that the position is playing as to sabotage and to do something to make damage to this process, the electoral process, and we need to be alert. When we, for example, have been talking to friends in Caracas, outside of Caracas, and basically they say that there is a huge number of gas stations that are not accepting, for example, bolivares from buyers or credit cards, only dollars in cash, which is creating some unrest among some people in some places. So we need to be alert with those things. And when people ask them why you until when you will be would, would be requesting dollars to buy gasoline, they said until July twenty eighth. So it's obviously that they are trying to sabotage in so many ways this uh, uh, electoral process. The the most strange thing that's happening now is that Maria Corina Machado, knowing that she was disqualified, organized a fraudulent a primary election, and then later name a candidate to replace her that was, her name was, uh, is uh, Corina Lloris, who was disqualified for having dual citizenship chip on the part of her husband. So this is something that has not been clarified by the mainstream media. The mainstream media still is saying that Corina Lloris was uh, blocked by Maduro to be uh, to be to run for the uh, to be president in Venezuela, and when and then we know that uh, Mundo Gonzalez Irutia, that who is very close to Corina Machado, is a, the right wing, the right wing candidate, participate in financing logistically in, in a brutal accident in Salvador, 
when he served as an official in the Venezuelan embassy in that country. And the time when Leopoldo Castillo, Leopoldo Castillo, that everybody knows in Venezuela, was uh, the ambassador at that time, and, and President Chavez called him El Matacura. Because basically in those years, uh, and, and also the art proof and document the, uh, from 1976 that proved that Gonzalez Urrutia entered in the Venezuelan embassy and, 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 and being a CIA agent and helping with money and resources to the right wing of Salvador and, and basically helping them in the entire massacres that were taking place at that time in El Salvador. There are all kinds of elements that prove his participation in the dirty war against Salvadorian people. Um, and he was using Venezuelan embassy with resources from the CIA. Right now, if, if we have this, uh, uh, it's very clear for us the, the, you know, that the opposition is, um, when we see the origin of the opposition, Lorenzo Mendoza, for example, we said for the Mendoza Zuluaga family, it's a cousin El Maria Machado, who owned Cedar Tour in, elect in the electricity of Caracas. So we know that Maria Corina is cousin of Caprile, who is owner of the craft and also craft, Mayonese craft, and also he is owner of, of several theaters and in other places in Caracas, around Venezuela. And also his cousin of Leopoldo Lopez. So we are talking about families that are connected and basically, if we make a family tree of the position, politician, we will see that they, there is no political struggle in Venezuela. There is, is a class struggle. And, and we need to be conscious about this. It's always the same people. Maria Corina Machado, uh, Zuluaga Mendoza, it's always the same people. And it's a clear class struggle that's taking place in Venezuela. Um, Maria Corina Machado, we always have to say she's prohibited wrong for treason because she in some way participated with the expropriation of Cisco and Monomero. She helped to create the Guarimbas. She also has been calling for sanctions against Venezuelan people. And she also has been uh, working and promoting the, the, the scarcity and and Bachaqueo de Alimentos in Venezuela. She also, uh, his signature is in the Carmona decree when President Chavez was overthrown. She has been promoting the, the dark or the black dollar in Venezuela. Um, she's also having asking paramilitary intervention in the United States. She also, uh, you know, was publicly uh, supporting Guyana against Venezuela. And also, she sent a letter to Netanyahu two years ago requesting him a military support to overthrow the Venezuelan government. Everything is documented. Everything is, uh, we can see everything that she has been and everything that she has been participating. So that's why she's not running. And that's why she has been disqualified. We, we have to be clear also that. Uh, this is a very critical moment for the Venezuelan people. Venezuelan people have been suffering one of the most horrendous consequences of the sanctions that everybody has been mentioning here. Uh, it's a, it's a, the consequence of the sanctions. It has been resistant. It has been resistant from the bottom. You know, it's very easy for someone that is president to resist because you can have still in the scarcity, have the resources. But for someone that is Come, you know, for someone that is outside in the countryside, someone that is living with her job, daily work, that has to go out to work to get resources, it's a tricky. Especially during the 22, 19, and 18, when the uh, when the um, sanctions were completely horrible against the Venezuelan people, I said. I want, to say, I want to say that the victory that the, 
Venezuelan government is taking right now is, is because the resistance of the popular power in Venezuela, the resistance of the commune, the resistance of the, of the grassroots movement, Venezuelan grassroots movement, being able to confront these uh, sanctions against the people and have been able to support to Venezuelan government despite all the uh, all the economic sabotage that have been taking place in Venezuela. I just want to invite everybody to be alert this coming 28th and uh, and also to thank everybody for this uh, great um, webinar. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, William, for uh, giving a background of the opposition candidates, especially you know, the connection among them and uh, pointing out the fact that it is not really a simply political struggle. I mean, it is political, but it's a class struggle, given the, that they are the oligarchic families whom President Maduro calls the sar names or apellidos all the time. He's mentioning them like that. There is a reason why. And you have pointed it out very clearly. So thanks a lot for this. And uh, I think we have come to an end of the presentations, but not not to an end of the webinar because now we'll open the question and answer sessions. We have, we seem to have like a lot of questions and probably people will be asking more. So here I have a sort of summarization of the questions and I will present them to uh, the, I mean, there are some people who have mentioned to whom the questions should be put. So I'll put it to them. But even after that, I mean, whoever wishes to uh, respond to a particular question, you can, to it. So if there is, uh, I mean, if nobody has mentioned anyone in particular, I will go in the order of, uh, of the speakers. And if anyone says that she or he or she is will not will like pass, then it will be like that we will go over to the next person. So the first question that I have here, I think it's put it is for Maria. So the question is, how does Southcom the United States Southern Command figure in the negotiations between the U.S. government and the Venezuelan government. So, Maria, uh, if you would like to answer that question. Well, this, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, the U.S. Southern Command is very much involved in everything related to the relationships with Venezuela. They are there as the boogeyman. They are there to uh, scare Venezuelans, indeed scare the whole region. They already have at least that I know of three uh, military bases in Guyana because ExxonMobil has taken over Guyana. The poor uh, president of Guyana is a, is a frightfully uh, unprepared, weak individual who has placed himself in the hands of, of Satan, which is ExxonMobil. And ExxonMobil being one of the, well, I would say the worst oil company in the world with the worst possible human rights and environmental um, um, record um, has availed itself with the Southern Command. So they are hand in hand there uh, wanting to, and actually they are right now, as we speak, stealing Venezuelan oil because they are t extracting oil from the disputed territory, which is against the Geneva uh, Accord. So what they are doing is they're trying very much to um, provoke Venezuela. There is nothing that they would want more than a little war between Venezuela and Guyana, which would not be Venezuela and Guyana, would be Venezuela versus the the Southern Command and the power of uh, ExxonMobil. But you know, <laughs> uh, people have always underestimated uh, Maduro. Maduro has been able to play this geopolitical um, chess game in a most marvelous way. He will go down as one of the great presidents of Venezuela, because in tremendous uh, opposition, he has managed to save his country and more than save it, help it flourish. Now, this is a presidential year 
in the United States. The last thing in the world that the Democratic Party wants is a skirmish or a war between Venezuela and Guyana. Okay, this is not what the Democrats want, even even in an in a non um, presidential year. But this presidential year, that is from now to, no, to November the fifth, that th there's not going to be a war there because the it would be very detrimental to the government of the United States. Not from not because of their goodness of heart, but this is just uh, you know geopolitics here. So we will have to um, uh, suspend our, uh, our our judgment until after the elections of the United States. If Trump wins, then there will be something very different that we will have to confront. Um, but right now, I would say that Maduro has a window of opportunity between now and the 5th of November, and he's using it very well. So right now, the Southern Command has had its teeth uh, sort of closed because they they can't do anything to Venezuela right now. Hmm. Okay, thanks a lot, Maria. And people who do not really know what the problem is with Guyana and Venezuela, it's about a territory called the Esequibo. There is a territorial dispute dating back to the 19th century created by Britain and in Orinoco Tribune we have published extensively about it so anybody who wishes to read about it please go to Orinoco Tribune just type Esequibo dispute and you will find it a lot of it anyway and if anybody else wishes to uh, comment on this question about uh, whatever Maria talked about it Southcom the uh, presence of Southcom the influence impact whatever of Southcom in the negotiations, yes, Francisco, I think. So please, Francisco, go ahead. Yeah, I, I made a mistake of putting the applause thing, but I wanted to say, I'm sorry about that. I think it plays a very significant role because I'm not sure, I'm not aware that Southcom participates in the negotiations itself. Nevertheless, it's such a powerful, threatening outfit um, because it's spread around the place. It's got between seven to ten military bases in Colombia. And you remember when the Defense Cooperation Agreement, you know, was signed between Uribe and, and George W. Bush in 2009, the Defense Cooperation Agreement allowed the United States military to use not only the military facilities of Colombia, but to use any civilian facilities that exist in the country in order to wage any real serious war against threats that come into Colombia. And the justification was, was the drug on wars. If you go back to the annual report from the South Cone regarding the situation in the what they call the Western Hemisphere, which is, you know, it's their backyard. Um, if you read all the other reports, 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to now, they demonize, they produce a military report of the threats coming to the United States, which they exaggerate. They have put Lula there, narco terrorists, Islamic terrorists, you know, you name it, they're all there. But the significance of that is not just that they use propaganda, which it is, but this information goes into the foreign affairs committees of both the Congress and the Senate, which is a very small club. And once they make a decision regarding those reports, then Congress and nobody is going to oppose it. The rest is done by the media. So therefore, in that sense, it's a very important thing. And regarding the um, Guyana, uh, I'm very concerned about that. I'm delighted to know from Maria that the United States doesn't want the conflict between Guyana and Venezuela. But given the amount of military deployment, exercises, mm. maneuvers, and so on, it's a bit worrying that it's there. And remember, behind Guyana and um, behind the United States is the expertise of the UK, the nasty UK, which is always that they know how to do things much better than the United States. So I think we should denounce the uh, South Com for interfering in things that they shouldn't be involved. That's the important thing, because the last thing we want is Southcom to be involved militarizing the negotiations that are necessary between Colom between Venezuela and Guyana. Oh, can I just say something? I, I I totally agree with you. The lethal uh, 
threat that the South c Command is for Venezuela. It has always threatened Venezuela, and it is threatened now even more because it's entered Guyana. I'm only saying that I do not think that the present government of the United States wants a war be before the 5th of, of, uh, uh, of November. So that's the only thing I've said. Do they want a war? Do they want to take over Venezuela? Sure they do. But I'm just saying that between now and the 5th of November, they don't want a war because they don't want to lose the elections. And Democrats are not going to vote for them if they start on another adventure. But I totally agree with you that the Southern Command is our enemy. And it is there and it is lethal. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Now I think we'll go over to the next question. I mean, there are many. So uh, since we are talking about war and armies and stuff, I would just like to ask you, anyone who wishes to, uh, I mean, I, I would probably start with Joe, but if anybody else wants to talk about it, then yes. So it is the question that why did the Colombian paramilitaries, uh, it is the one paramilitary organization that recently reached out to Venezuelan authorities, telling them that the Venezuelan right wing has contacted them, uh, asking them to destabilize Venezuela both before and after the elections, like creating chaos, uh, um, sort of invading with paramilitary men. So uh, if Joe wishes to answer, you can start. And if you do not, then I will go over to William and then come back to Maria and Francisco. Like, why did Colombian paramilitaries contact Venezuelan authorities instead of invading Venezuela? Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know. Uh, I can only speculate that it might be just an attempt at intimidation to, uh, to spread fear. That could be one motive. Uh, perhaps other people have more details than I do. For that. Okay, thank you. If William wishes to uh, talk about it, please. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. I don't see any reason why they the news. Uh, I think that I, I, I had the same thought that Joy, I feel is they are trying to create fear in the in the Venezuelan population. Okay, so it's a fear tactic. It could be a fear tactic, yes. And uh, uh, Maria, if you wish to talk about it, and of course, Francisco, I'll come to you. Well, I'd like just to say it is another example of the idiocy of the Venezuelan uh, opposition. Uh, they have they have all the money in the world. They have all the power in the world, but they're imbeciles over and over and over again. While well, we could have a list of all the stupid things that they have done, this is one of the stupid things that the whichever group it was in the in the in in the far right have done to go to these uh, 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 Colombian paramilitaries whom whom they didn't even know where their loyalties were. Huh? and say, oh, go attack Venezuela. I, I'm with the, with them. They told them, go take a hike. Do you think we're going to do this for you? Um, so uh, I just want to say, uh, jot this down to the sheer imbecility of the right-wing uh, groups in, in Venezuela. Not all of them, but of, of, of the extreme right-wing groups. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, Francisco, if you wish to. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I had, I was privy to some information regarding that. But my sense is this. Um, when Freddy Bernal took charge of the border, you know, this very dangerous border, and then in a period of a couple of years, was able to clean up, and I'm using diplomatic words here, he was able to clean up a number of bases, a number of operations, a number of groups, and so on, and you know, literally cleaned up the border from paramilitaries in that area. And this has expanded quite significantly with the number, I don't know how many um, casualties were on the paramilitary side. And I think they realized that Venezuela was a serious business and you couldn't do what you used to do. So maybe, given now there is a process of peace in, in Colombia, Maybe there is a section of the paramilitary that say, okay, we're going, only going to be able to become legal if we behave. And I think possibly that is behind it. Because the other thing, the other proposal is the one thousand that are going there, they are unlikely to come back. I, I think that's possibly their their calculation. Okay. Could, can so, I, can I yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, during the one of the Ch Chavez years the United States wanted to declare the uh, um, 
the uh, groups that were fighting in Colombia as terrorists. And President Chavez very, very strongly said, look, they're not terrorists. Um, there is a, an, an ideological battle going on here. Uh, they are not simply terrorists or criminals. Now, what did happen is what, what Francisco is talking about, that Bernal uh, cleaned up the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, that whole area because narco -traf traffic has entered, narco -traf narco-traffic groups had entered. And so they, uh, the, they were able to distinguish, look, these guys are criminals over here. All they want is to uh, sell, uh, uh, you know, drugs. But over here are legitimate, well, you know, I'm, I'm not espousing them, but I'm saying these are people who legitimately for ideological reasons had taken up arms. And I think that uh, the, this uh, uh, group recognized that. They said, we are not criminals. We are not sort of, you know, narco traffics. We are engaging in, in, in a class struggle or an ideological struggle. And we want Venezuela to realize that. And so I think this was in their interest also to say, we're not going to mess around with the Venezuelan government because uh, there is this background of Chavez having recognized that these guys have taken up arms because of an idea of an ideology of, of, of a class struggle and not because they were criminal selling uh, uh, selling our, uh, drugs, which maybe some of them had, but they, they were not criminal gangs. Anyway, that's what I just okay. want. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's. Um, I mean, it can be anything. It really can be anything, but it probably is that they do not want to mess with Venezuela. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and the last question about Southcom is that, the, is the United States Southcom trying to make Argentina into a kind of proxy against Venezuela? Now that Colombia under Petro is trying to free itself from being the Israel of Latin America. So I'll ask this to Francisco. And if anyone else uh, wishes to answer, Definitely. Uh, the United States is trying to expand these military positions everywhere it can, every time. Um, I, I don't think Millet is doing very well regarding the robust economy. He's wrecking the economy. Um, from that point of view, it's not the same as in the 80s when the United States tried to encourage Argentina to go and invade Nicaragua with a multinational Latin American military force in order to deal with the Sandinista problem. I don't think that's possible now. There are two reasons for it. Number one, the United States is not as influential as it was. Millet doesn't have the um, support of his population. I doubt the military in Argentina are going to say, sure, Mr. Millet, you know, whatever you want, we're going into this adventure. I think it's unlikely, especially after the defeat of the military um, dictatorship in Argentina, where the military became traumatized and, on, and they have behaved to some important degree ever since. So I think it's unlikely, even though to have for the United States, to have military bases in Patagonia and other places is a problem. Okay, so if anybody else wishes to answer this, and otherwise we'll go over to the next question. Okay, so it seems that it's okay. So we'll go to the next one, which is about the Carter Center. So the Carter Center, we know that it is an observer in the July 20th election. Should we be worried about their presence in Venezuela? This is from our friend Nino Paglicia, and he says that he is worried about their presence in Venezuela. So should we also be worried about it? So whoever wishes to take it up, please. I think Joe can, because he already talked about it. Yeah. Well, worried. I, I just think we should be aware that the Carter Center is, is a liberal imperialist group. Uh, you know, they... They play, they play a, in a way a more clever game than the, uh, the, the, let's say the Republican side or the Trump side of the, uh, of the political spectrum, which is very upfront. I mean, they, they make no intention to disguise that uh, they, they are, they're basically Nazis, in my opinion. They, 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 have no, they make no bones about it. So we just have to be aware that just how, that's why I went over their track record in detail. So yeah, we have to be aware of them. The damage, they can only do damage if people think they're credible. If people take or overtake uh, or to take their, their pronouncements too seriously and don't uh, aren't aware of where they're coming from, what of the, of their bias. Uh, William, do you wish to talk about it? No, I pass. 
Oh, okay, okay. No, I just saw you, so I thought I was. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, very, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I think the problem, um, if the you know if the Venezuelan government invited the Carter Center, I think we do, we should rely on their um, judgment because they know what they're doing. They invited originally even a, a what they call a electoral commission from the European Union. And this invitation was withdrawn. And the reason was that the European Union um, renewed the sanctions against Venezuela. And therefore, they could not be an independent party. So that invitation was withdrawn. Where from between now and the 28th of July, the cartel said to misbehave. But where are they to misbehave? During the election itself, that invitation will be withdrawn in seconds. And Venezuela is sufficiently powerful and independent to be able to do that. I don't think it would be too damaging. Nevertheless, it would be a problem if they were to misbehave, which is unlikely. Okay, so thank you. And now we'll go over to, I think, the politics in Venezuela. So this is an interesting question, and it's about the upcoming election. So do you expect the opposition politicians and parties that are not violent or that have not been, you know, like abstentionist, will they be able to separate themselves from the no, Machado, Leopoldo Lopez aligned far right and cooperate with Chavismo or sort of coexistence with Chavismo. And uh, like, what are some sorts of outcomes to expect from this? So the person who asked this question, I think she, that person asked it for Maria. So I'll go to Maria first and then whoever else wishes to uh, answer it, Cam. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Look, the... The opposition, the great characteristic of the opposition groups and parties is the antagonism and conflict that they have with each other. They, they are not a monolithic group. They have been fighting tooth and nail one after the other. The other thing that I want to stress is that the extreme right, that is Maria Corina Machado and her poor old fellow, Mundo that she carries around with the photograph so people know who he is, right? Um, she who is backed by Leopoldo Lopez and, and Guaido and all of those kind of people, right? Are hated by the other opposition parties that have, uh, you know, uh, signed the agreement that they're not going to contest the elections, that they're going to accept the results, that they're not going to be in violence. In violence. Why? Well, this woman goes and, for example, um, to campaign in Zulia. She campaigns in Zulia and she doesn't even say hello to Rosales, who's the governor there. She does the same thing in Nueva Esparta. She goes to Nueva Esparta, who has a governor on the opposition, doesn't even talk to them. She, when in her talks and in her rallies, she never mentions the other sort of leaders, you know, because it's all me, 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 me. And so all of this creates an atmosphere in which she, she's, I think she's one of the most detested people in the political life of Venezuela because of this tremendous conflict uh, at, at, that she has. The other thing that ha has happened with the opposition, and this is not very nice for, for them, is that um, Guaido and his band of criminals, in which I include the Machado, did not uh, really spread the, the, the money that the Americans gave them. Hmm? So you hear uh, many of the spokespeople in Miami just saying all kinds of terrible things about them. But really, it's about the money, you know. They kept the money. They didn't spread this money amongst all of them. So that's another reason why they're so angry at them. Um, and uh, to be fair, uh, the the opposition, with the exception of Inmundo, Edmundo and uh, Ma Martinez, I think it is. Um, Marquez. Marquez. Um, were the only two who did not sign the declaration that the um, Commission of e Elections has had asked them to, which is pretty ominous, which means they're, they're going to go out there and do whatever they want. But I believe that the others have a lot to gain to have stood at these elections, because it means that they are, if in the next election, be able to say, 
we joined in the a democratic process and we got so many votes, you know, and we have so many people backing us. And that's really good for a, a political, let's say, uh, a, a culture that you do have some opposition parties that they have that they have uh, not uh, wanting to do any kind of violence, that they have some people backing them and that they can be, you know, a, an opposition within a normal kind of a politics. So I, I don't think they're going to go with uh, Maria Corina Machado, who is considered una loca, quite crazy, uh, even within, uh, I know, listen, I know a lot of people in opposition, okay? Uh, a lot of them. Uh, and in, 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 in not only in pol politics, but in social media, in social uh, relationships, they intensely dislike her and, of course, Edmundo. And I don't think these other parties are going to give up what they're going to gain by playing the democratic game, uh, game uh, this time around. Um, they, they're going to be, they're, they're, uh, as they've always been, separate and for themselves and wanting to keep all the money and all the backing of the United States and the poor United States, they keep they keep they keep uh, betting on the wrong horse. Okay, thank you, Maria. Yes, I like to say that there is not one Venezuelan opposition. There are several Venezuelan oppositions. So I think it, they are exactly talking about that thing. Now there is something about another person from the opposition who is Manuel Rosales. So this question is uh, for uh, William Kamakaro. So the question, there are two, both related to the primaries, the opposition primaries that was hosted, organized by Maria Corina Machado's NGO, Sumate. And it is the two things. The, do you believe that Machado really got 92% of the votes in the opposition primaries? And do you know why Rosales refused to participate in those primaries, even though his party, Un Nuevo Tiempo, is one of the opposition's main parties? I mean, one of part of the unitary platform. So it's for William, but we'll come to anyone else who also who wishes to answer. Okay, yeah, um, I don't think that she get enough vote uh, the, the, in fact they burn all the ballots after immediately after the so-called primary so there is no way to prove that she got that number that she claims so no way to prove that uh and we are accustomed from the maria corina machado organized that kind of primaries and elections where then that <laughs> where supposedly she get big numbers of voters supporting her, and then there is no way to prove the, how many people were voting for her. So, so that, yes, she didn't get that number of vote. And also, uh, the other question is about, let me see, I don't know. I'm sorry, what the other question? It's, uh, Rosales, it's about, it's about oh, Rosales, why Manuel yeah. Rosales refused to participate, yeah. Yeah, Rosales, it's, Everybody should know, and I think that all, all of us knows here that the, the, the opposition is completely divided. They are fighting among themselves. In the beginning, there was some kind of uh, a, you know, close relation between Rosales and, and, and Maria Corina Machado, but after several months, I would say, they start to fight back. <laughs> they start to fight. And, and yes, Rosales decide decide to to basically drop her his support to Maria Colina Machado. Um I think that Maria Colina Machado it is is because she has been she's someone that's coming from the lead. She like she loved she liked and she loved to impose her will to the rest of the population. And that's what she has been doing to the entire uh allies that at the end people try not to get in touch with her, they're trying to work by themselves. Because uh, if, first of all, she's, everybody knows that she is the one that is half in some way the blessed from the United States and, and the resources. And she's also connected with the entire corruption that has been happening in the opposition, <laughs> that have been basically stealing the entire resources of the Venezuelan people uh, from the oil industry, from Cisco, and from monomeros. So they have been able to make a lot of money uh, from the Venezuelan people. So, and she's one of those that have been getting a lot of benefits. So 
yeah, I think that that's one of the main reasons. And and for and I in and they are completely divided. There is no way that they can united because they have been all this time. And yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. There okay, William, thank you moment. very much uh, for that uh, response. And I think Francisco also wishes to talk about it. So please go ahead. Yeah, I think the United States needs a candidate which is a point of pressure. And the point of pressure of the candidate of the opposition has one weapon, which is not recognition of the results. And that is the problem, or was the problem with um, Rosales. Rosales in the past demonstrated he was able to recognize the results of the election in 2006. Remember, Chavez got 63, Rosales got 37, the intensity of the opposition was similar at the time in terms of the accusation, the dictatorship, and what have you. And this time round, Borsali was moving himself into a position of becoming the focus of all what people call the loyal opposition so that he could capitalize electorally. He really has a good position being a, the governor of Syria, and he wanted to continue to capitalize on that. Nevertheless, their problem was Borsali was prepared to recognize the results and they couldn't have that. And that's why the United States, I'm sure, through Maria Corina Machado and others, put pressure on him. In other words, they told him, if you insist on being the candidate, not prepared to not recognize the result, will make your life a mystery, will sabotage you. So he decided to pull out. Okay, so thanks a lot for that. Yeah, he pulled out at the... Like it was a sort of unexpected, but anyway. So uh, I'll just quickly ask uh, the next question. I think it's uh, I should it should be asked about it. It's that why are these all these people all these traitors? I mean, Guaido, like he was these questions exist. That is why was Guaido allowed to flee? Why is Machado, Maria Corina Machado, allowed to you know, roam around the country freely despite having committed several acts of treason and coup attempts and everything? And the same goes to Enrique Caprile, same goes to a lot of opposition on the hard right opposition. So the question is why they're allowed to do so, why they are not in prison, why they are not being, you know, in a, uh, why they are not facing justice. So uh, whoever wishes to go. Please. And I think we are all already out of time, so we'll try to keep it short. Well, um, I'm with the I'm with who asked the question. I want to see all of them in the deepest, deepest dungeon in Venezuela. Somebody <laughs> throw away the key and we never see them again. OK, so they are traitors of Maria Corina Machado. Her father was a thief and she is a thief and she is a traitor to the Venezuelan people and Capriles, never mind Capriles and Leopoldo Lopez, how many deaths they uh, uh, incurred the same as uh, uh, Machado. Now, this is my prediction. My prediction is that on the 29th of July, she is gonna get on a plane and go to Miami because the Venezuelans have had it up to here with her. Seven, According to Hinterlasses, 72% of Venezuelans want her and all of those who have asked for military invasion of the country and sanctions to be put behind jail. And I tell you, she's gonna flee just like the rest of the Cucarachas have fled. Um, I think that with respect to Guaido, the government played what uh, the, the wonderful boxer Ali did. It was called rope-a-dope, that he was against the ropes and he let his uh, uh, opponent just battle and battle. They hit him until he, they got so, so tired that he was able to knock him down. So I think that's what he did with Guaido. I think that with Guaido is now a sorry uh, a person. He's very he's very rich. He's got all the money in the world, but he is a, a, a un cadaver. What do you call that? A corpse. Mm, cadaver. <laughs> and Machado on the 29th of July is going to be a political corpse because of what is going to happen. But I think that this time around, if Maduro gets a really large um, uh, you know, voting, and because we now have a real attorney general, they are going to bring uh, uh, charges against her, charges against uh, Capriles also. Uh, well, we can't do anything about Leopoldo Lopez because he's of course exiled uh, over there. But I think that this is going to happen because people are very, very upset that they are walking around doing all of this. So I, I'm with I'm with the person who sent the question. I want to see her behind bars. 
Exactly. We all want it. We all want to see them behind bars, all of them. If anybody else wishes to answer this, otherwise we'll pass over to the next, which is also related to the political scenario. So, okay. So I'll just ask this. It's a. I uh, will keep it. We'll try to keep it short. Whoever wishes to answer, that what are the speakers' perspectives on the left groups like the Communist Party of Venezuela, the Marea Socialista, the PPT? I think. Uh, I forgot. But anyway, and the MRT, which was which were once part of the Great Patriotic Poll, but then left over critics of Maduro and what some of them call his turn towards neoliberalism. So if Maria wishes to answer it, she can. If anybody else wants to take it up. Yes, to... well, I think these groups have actually not read the Communist Manifesto because if they had read the Communist Manifesto, they would see that Maduro and his government is not a liberal capitalist government, but that has really taken hold of the, those industries that are most important for the country, that has used the, the money of, of, of the state for the benefit of the people and something that I don't know uh, that they may not be interested in, but that we certainly are. It is a government that has greatly respected and, and uh, exercised the human rights of its population. Um, the Partido Comunista has lost its way. This is a partido that had a, a wonderful uh, history. They were there facing the dictators. They, they, they were there being killed by Carlos Andres Perez and, 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 and Betancourt and even, oh, El Beato uh, 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 the Caldera. They had a wonderful background. And they, have, quite frankly, have just lost the ball. I think they've lost their marbles. They are backing a right winger in, in this thing. And unfortunately, it has to do with uh, soberbia, which means a sort of pride. Oh, nice. You know, they want to be the ones to tell Baduro what to do, and uh, they feel that uh, that they weren't. Maria Socialista, poor, uh, from the very start, Maria uh, Mar Maria Socialista also had that. They thought that Maduro should, or Chavez actually should have come to them and they would have dictated what the government was going to do. So I'm afraid there's a lot of ego going out there. And uh, and they uh, have lost the ball, lost their sense. Okay. And they have, I think, um, this, like I think they called sort of dirtied the, the, the wonderful background that they had and the struggles of the past. I think, quite frankly, uh, that uh, they will rule the day and I mm -hmm. hope that they will come back uh, the, uh, to their mm -hmm. senses and I hope that they read the Communist Manifesto. Uh, yeah, thank you, Maria. I love your passion. And I think there is already a lot of divisions within the PCV over over whether to go along with Chavez more, whether to go uh, separate. So yeah, I, I am sure that they will come to their senses. I hope they do because I really actually like them. So um, there is another question, which is also related to politics. Uh, why did, uh, okay, so there is one question, but I'd like to connect it with the present. So why did Chavez will lose the 2015 National Assembly election and my question is if there is go if there can be something similar in the upcoming 28 July election that if I mean there is always a probability that a candidate can lose but is there a probability that the 2015 National Assembly feat could be uh, repeated by the opposition this time so who wishes to answer this <laughs> That's okay hard. yeah definitely I think William is in best position because he's from there but um, there was a moment of confusion in 2000, because Chavez died in 2013. And then the election of Maduro was rather tight. Um, and then this was followed by violence. And immediately followed by a very concerted effort by the private sector to hoard and make food disappear, increasing prices massively producing a huge number of queues, very similar to Allende. That's sort of context. Um, and many people, I think, part of the Chavista current, you know, socially speaking, overall, I think they lost their heart and thought this is the end of the revolution. And the reason why um, Chavismo lost the 2015 National Assembly was not because the position win votes or won votes, was because a significant proportion of Chavistas abstained. 
and I think it was between 20 to 25 percent. And I think that has been Chavismo ever since I've been trying to recover that section of the population. Um, was extraordinary. They nearly got to thirds. Now, let me just a foot, very brief footnote. If you are a, a, an effective political current and you win two thirds of the National Assembly against a sole enemy, which is Chavismo, and you mess it up completely and totally incapable of doing something serious, it shows you how incapable, incompetent they are. But nevertheless, I think that was the reason. And ever since, you know, the United States, remember, began to apply sanctions around, I think it was with Obama in 2014-15. I think it was the 9th of March. And you can see how things coincide. Chavez died, the opposition organizes, you know, sabotage of the economy, and then the United States begins their sanctions. And ever, ever since, the situation has been quite difficult. Only after <clears throat> 10 years, Maduro was able to recover the situation. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Francisco, and also like the connection with Allende. So, William, since since Francisco mentioned you, I'd like to go to you and ask you the same question about uh, why 2015 was lost and if uh, opposition can also win this time. Uh, yes, um, definitely the extension. We have a huge amount of people that didn't vote. Uh, people were unhappy with the economy situation. Uh, I think that is the extension, extension is also uh, always after that has been playing an important role in every election in Venezuela. Um, I feel that this time, uh, because people are able to see that the economy is, is, in, is getting better and the situation economy is really m much better than three, four years ago, I feel that even despite the, the consequence of the sanctions, the still people are suffering the consequence of the sanctions. I feel that more people will go to vote from the side of the of the Chavist, of the Chavistas, and also I believe um, there in, in the main and because when people see that the government is moving forward, justice again, corruption. And as this resolving all their problems, I think that in that measure people will be voting for Chavez. So, yeah. Okay, William, thank you very much. And Maria wishes to also talk about it, so please go on. Yes, well, I, I agree with both of you. Um, but there's one other element that was really important in that election, and that is the US strategy for the election. Well, the, the, uh, the opposition <laughs> didn't come up with this. Uh, uh, as Francisco has said, they receive orders from Washington. And the strategy for the opposition at that point <clears throat> was don't go after Chavez, don't go after the Misiones. Say that you're going to keep everything. Say that, oh, no, you're not going to lose your house, you're not going to leave your, lose your car, and you're not going to lose your, your business. You, you know, you, you, uh, but for us, we're going to bring prosperity, but we, we're not going to get rid of the Cuban doctors. We're, gonna, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to keep the missiones. Now, of course, you ask, uh, can this be replicated? Can they do this again? No, for two reasons. One, they lied, okay? These, these were all lies. Second of all, the incompetency of these people. They had the assembly. What did they do with the assembly? They turned it into a, a political uh, opposition and did nothing. Didn't, didn't pass laws, didn't govern. They, so, so these are two things in people's mind. One, they lied to us. Second of all, they were incompetent. And now they look at Maduro and they say, out of this hellhole in which these opposition people have put us, in which these opposition prayed and begged for these sanctions, in which these opposition people prayed for the Marines to come, and we were in a hellhole. It was Maduro and his very competent team that pulled us out of it, and now we've got a economic growth uh, estimated by others that by the end of this year it's going to be 8%. This was an economic miracle because of the, uh, of the other, um, I won't go into the other economic um uh, sort of policies that uh, Maduro did. So Maduro has pulled out an economic miracle in, in Venezuela. Any other country with a quarter, with a fifth, with a sixteenth of what has happened to Venezuela, the, the government would have folded. It didn't fold. 
Why? Because we have a revolution. Because we have a Bolivarian revolution. We have it in the government. We have it on the street. We have it in the communes, in the communal council, in the militias. We have it out on the fields, those people feeding Venezuela. We are now self-sufficient in food. So Maduro has pulled out this incredible economic miracle and the people will vote for him. He's highly popular. And they know that the opposition lied and were incompetent. And that was why, and, and of course they had this, this strategy from the US saying, oh, oh no, you're gonna keep all of that, which of course they didn't. So anyway, ah. that's my take on the- Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. And not only did they mess up or not only did were they incompetent, they also called for the sanctions from that very national assembly. Like they used it to, to commit treason. So that is also something that people will remember forever. Traitors are never forgiven. So uh, uh, William wishes to add something. So please come on and add it, uh, but be very short because we just will take another yes. question and then wrap up. Yes, very short. I just want to mention that the opposition have been basically uh, trying the saying that they will eliminate several of, of the program that the state have, like a club, for example, they want to eliminate the club uh, they want to also uh, eliminate the law reform that was created by Chavez and, 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 and return that land that though the, the, the campesino movement has been able to reclaim. Um, and so they want to return those, a huge amount of land back to the big landlords. So it is a huge program of privatization from uh, Maria Corina Machado, she has been talking very openly about it. So all of that is creating a reaction from the population of Venezuela. And we have to think that the situation in Venezuela is economically difficult, not because Maduro, it's because the sanctions. So those social programs are there because people are facing, confronting the sanctions to help people to confront those sanctions. So, and they want to eliminate those programs. So I, I feel that it's contraproductive for them to be talking about it. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, yeah, definitely understandable. So Maria Corina has said, first thing she said that she would privatize the PDVSA. Great, great thing to do. Anyway, so we'll just come to the last question. It's by Alan Freeman. And I believe that this question is directed towards people outside Venezuela. I believe so, especially for solidarity movements, it could be anything. So the question is, what can we do to help Venezuela obtain the influence it deserves in world politics. So this, I believe it's a question for people outside Venezuela and especially for solidarity movements. Uh, I think I'll come to Francisco first and then anyone else who wishes to keep uh, answer it. This will be the last question and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, that's a very good question. Venezuela already has a substantial influence in Latin America, but the mechanism to ensure this is even more effective is regime integration. And already there are moves regarding re you know, restoring UNASUR, but we need SELAC really, and Venezuela can play a very substantial role there. That's number one. Once its oil industry recovers, Venezuela will be able to play that pivotal role in helping everybody else in all sorts of ways, as it did in the past. So that's number one. But that's not sufficient. Number two, Venezuela is already requested to integrate to be far part of BRICS. And the, <clears throat> Venezuela enjoys a very substantial strategic relationship with China. Chavez went to uh, China six times, and every time they signed agreements of every kind, in total, I think the total number of agreements that exist between Venezuela and China since 1999 is in the region of 750, which is gigantic, covers absolutely every aspect of it. And Venezuela joining in, uh, the BRICS is going to really give that sort of more international, more geopolitical role. And remember, it's an oil, it's an oil economy. So energy is quite important in this geopolitical battle that's going on, where the United States is losing and the new emerging geopolitics, which is very beneficial, is actually winning. So in that sense, it seems to me that the joining the BRICS is going to really make it, but the key for that influence to be exerted is the economic recovery fully of Venezuela. Otherwise, you will not be able to play that helping role to everybody else in the region as well as elsewhere. Uh, if anyone else wishes to uh, have anything to say about this, 
Yes, well, I'd like to say um, thank you, uh, Francisco, for that. That's very true. But I think Alan is saying, what can we do? I think one of the biggest problems that we have is the media barrier, the media, I would say, uh, horrible war against Venezuela. Um, and the only thing I can say is, however we can, wherever we can, we have to uh, uh, deny the lies that are being said about Venezuela in whatever media that there is. Because uh, of course, uh, the empire runs the media, owns the newspapers, owns the social media and whatever. So that is a really, really hard uh, problem uh, that we have, to, uh, we have to struggle with and try however we can to deny all the lies that are being said in the media about Venezuela. And I just want to end up by thanking so much uh, Jesus Rodriguez and the Orinoco Tribune because their uh, media outlet has been phenomenal, fantastic, especially because it's great standards. And I go to it not only just to receive new, uh, news about Venezuela, but about the world because we have found so much really balanced and good information about what's happening in Ukraine and, and China and Europe and whatever. Uh, it has been there because you have wonderful standards and I want to thank you. And I'm just saying we we really need more and more uh, attacking the media that is just so ferocious against Venezuela. Thank you, uh, all, all of you. Thanks a lot, Maria. Yes, I I always say that, yeah, I mean, hybrid war, a part of the hybrid war is the war, media warfare. It's definitely something that is necessary. So thanks a lot for the praise for Orinoco Tribune and everyone who is here, please read and spread, not just Orinoco Tribune, but any any media from Venezuela or that reports really good on Venezuela to counter the lies and misinformation of mainstream media. And um if if William or if uh, Joe wishes to say anything about media, Joe has a lot, done a lot of work on media, so I might I, he might wish to say something about this. So if you do, we'll, it will be the last thing we'll talk about, and then I'll wrap up. Yeah, I would just read it. Well, first of all, yes, thanks tremendously to all of you for organizing this. You know, it takes a lot of work, so yeah, I'm very grateful, grateful for, for all your efforts. Um, Regarding media, I just I guess like I'll reiterate to to be aware of of, of the kind of limited dissent that we're pressured to to settle for um, that comes from the likes of well I I, mean, I singled out the Carter Center in my presentation but I could have talked about the big human rights NGOs the the liberal politicians like uh, like San, Bernie Sanders and AOC they'll offer a very limited very feeble dissent that ends up doing more harm than good, just reinforcing all the worst assumptions. So in our work, I think we need to focus on that, be wary of it and and not not settle for for tokenism. So that, that would be my message. And again, thanks again to everybody. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. So if we, we, William, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, okay, so I'm not seeing him anyway. So it means that we have reached the end of this webinar like today's webinar and thanks a lot to the speakers who like not not only for your presentations but also your detailed responses to the questions i love your passion i love your like everything that you do so thanks a lot for being here today with us and uh the other organizer apart from Orinoco tribune the other organizer of today's webinar is a international manifesto group who do a tremendous work and yes i think international manifesto group is already famous to everyone who is attending today so thanks a lot to you also and i'd also like to thank all the co-sponsors and i'll name all of them because they have also done a lot of good work in spreading the truth about venezuela so the co-sponsors of today's webinar were alliance for global justice the venezuela, venezuela solidarity campaign uk the geopolitical economy report luis real bolivarian circle fire this time movement for social justice the venezuela solidarity network us Mint Press News. Uh, these were all the co-sponsors and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I also thank all the listeners for being here, for joining the webinar, for asking questions. And I'm, I, I'm sorry that I could not take two or three questions because of the lack of time. However, 
there is a second part of this webinar next Sunday, that is on 14th July. And it will be at the same time as this one. So if we have not taken two or three questions, you can ask them there. You can also like ask uh, more questions. Of course, there there will be four different people, like four different panelists in that webinar. But we will all be here to join it, to enjoy it. So please, please um, join the next day's webinar also. And I would also like to uh, remind you that we are planning to organize another, uh, I mean, a post-election webinar in September, in early September. So if anybody wishes to be part of that in whatever way you wish to, so in whatever you wish to, so please you can contact either International Manifesto Group or Orinoco Tribune. You can just contact, you can go to, as for Orinoco Tribune, you can go to the Orinoco Tribune website and there is contact. You can use the contact or you can contact us through any of our social media. We try to be present everywhere and I'm sure our International Manifesto Group is also like that. So join or contact any of them to, if you wish to be part of the post-election webinar that we are planning to do in early September. And uh, so with that, I think we would wrap up for today. Thanks a lot to all of you for being present here. And finally, yes, uh, I, I believe Chavis Mo will win on 28th of July. Oh. <laughs> Viva Venezuela. <laughs> Viva. <laughs> Un abrazo, compas. <laughs> Thank you. Un abrazo a ti.